Thanks. My name is Isaac Julian, and I'd like to, um, first of all, welcome you all to this series of Parallel Voices, which is now in its second year. The series talks focuses on performance visual arts and the moving image, and has been created by myself in conjunction with the kind patience and support of Siobhan Davis Studio, which of course includes Sue herself, who has generously invited me to create this series in her wonderful space and whose work beside me in devising this series. And I also have to confess to my personal interest in um, confessing to this title, Expanding the Choreographic Imagination, which I'd like to talk a little bit about. I'm also very indebted to the kindness and support of Alison Proctor, who's put up with all my insistent demands, um, which I hope she can forgive me, and Nina Baker, who's worked on the publicity for the series, this series is entitled Expanding Choreographic Imagination, since it's my hope to discuss the relationship between visual arts performance and their creative evolution and their present manifestations. And for me, um, my approach to making images parallels that of choreography. For example, the use of camera work, creating the mise-en-scene in the multi-screen works, and here you have Conservator's Dream um, on the side here, which is the first piece of work which I made involving um, choreography or working with choreographers. And for me, expanding the choreographic imagination is about the interrelated conversations and practices um, that develop where different artistic disciplines intersect and contaminate one another. And that question of, of contamination is really very vital and important. Today, we can see across a wide variety of artistic visual art practices in the cinema, in video art, in dance, theatre, performance, architecture, which is very exciting and indicates for me um, an epistemological turn, not exactly a break, but I see it obviously as a kind of um, turn against certain market demands. And for example, I think one only has to think of the Martin Creed piece performed recently at Tate Britain, um, where we can think about the question of performance taking center stage within that institution, which I thought was absolutely incredibly exciting and invigorating. We can trace these trajectories, of course, to a historical moment, and here I think about Bruce Narman, I think about Pablo's performance, which he's just performed for us wonderfully. And I think, for me, um, when I was first approached by C to create a series of talks and discussions between performance, moving image, and dance, I noticed, and I think so did she, something significant that had been developing in the arts among artists across disciplines which converge around the axis of what I detect as a new strain of performance in the arts. And for me, this has been very significant. This is where I first came associated with Pablo's work in Performer um, 07, where he showed, and also reading Catherine Wood's work, and also meeting Helena Blaker as well and her writings. And of course, um, thinking about this in relationship to the moving image, the dance world, I think, and the w works which I've been involved in for some other fantasy as well, signals perhaps a, a kind of reaction to the overwhelming presence of the object, um, which is prized by the market. And I think it's precisely then the kind of foregrounding of ideas, a return to ideas, individual arts and dance, which has been supplemented by these other drives and interests of which I want to call the choreographic imaginations being one of those. So for me, um, it's very important to think about the breaking down the barriers which exist between different artistic disciplines. I, I sh share those with Sue a self-reflective practice which draws from and comments on film, dance, photography, and sculpture, which aims to unite and deconstruct, in fact, contaminate each other. And I think that's in incredibly important. So to, to, we're going to have a discussion 
Um, and we have mm -hmm. Helena Blaker um, on our right, who's a writer and curator who's worked in theatre and developed through her training as a visual artist. She has worked with the Tate Modern, the British Film Institute, the National Theatre, the Republic Art Development Trust, and the White Chapel to create and discuss histories of visual art performance through the moving image. And she has recently created a programme of dance films for dance and screen agency Capture, and is writing a book for the Bear Family Arts Council on the performing arts and film. And she's completing a PhD in recent developments in creating visual art performance and history. So I thought an excellent um, sort of um, protagonist here in our discussions. Um, and Pablo Bronstein, um, who's born in Buenos Aires, who now is based in London. His works include the large scale site specific performance that looks at architecture and movement. Um, he recently created Pan Nostra Square, a video installation where the choreographed dance movements with an architectural setting, which can be seen in the fantastic presentation, I must say, downstairs. Um, and his work can be seen at Tate Britain at the ICA. Um, Land Banner House, Munich. Performance work includes Tate Triennale, 2006, Performer 07 New York, as well as work with the Bavaria State Ballet. And so this opens, as it were, our beginning for really thinking uh, through these in a, in a very conservational manner, um, these kind of key questions. And I think with that, I'd like to kind of maybe kind of um, start with um, um, Helena, um, who, you know, is going to help frame our thoughts and discussions here. <coughs> Thank you, thanks. Um, yes, it's very exciting to be involved in this discussion and we have also ourselves had some really uh, vibrant, <coughs> vigorous discussions between us when we were planning uh, what we were going to say today. Um, we've been preparing it, I suppose, for about six months or so, thinking about it. And uh, to tell the truth, actually, uh, I have uh, had a very clear sense of what it was I wanted to talk about, which relates primarily to the work that I've been doing for the last few years, which uh, is as a visual art curator, I've been looking at the history of uh, visual art performance, as Isaac mentioned, uh, but through its traces and its historical material, how that, how, they've, how that material has been used in the last 10 years and how the history uh, has been transformed by new artistic practices, such as re-performing. Um, and also, I have been curating uh, more recently a, f a program, a single screen program of films about uh, uh, dance on film, where I have been looking at how the camera uh, pays attention to the choreographic movement in order for myself to understand what dance movement is, because I don't come from dance, I come from visual art. So I was excited to be asked to talk about it and think about it more, and at an earlier stage of our discussions, I was very clear about the fact that I wanted to talk about history, re-performing, using historical material, and then because of these two particular artists who, uh, whose work I'm looking at uh, in terms of contemporary practice, staging, issues of staging, panoramic scale, uh, public space, um, and the different media that Isaac and Pablo use, different mediums of film and live work. And then uh, on, on, on another more specific level, because of the context that we are in, I wanted to look at styles of movement in both of their work. But what has happened is that in the last, um, in the very recent period since we've been talking, I've been um, reading very closely Catherine Wood's book on Yvonne Rayner's uh, Mind of a Muscle, um, and it has, it has provided a new way out of looking at what performance is in contemporary art, or at least what, uh, what it may be, what its significance may be. And this is really a, th a, a theoretical dimension which has come in and rather pushed aside my own interests in formal issues. Uh, it's not to say that they are not consistent with each other, but, but my plan to ask Isaac and Pablo to talk to me to tell us about how they make their work, what the formal questions are in their work, um, has, been, has been displaced really by this sense that there is a kind of paradigm shift that was created by Yvonne Rayner, 
which did come from dance, a dance history, but which is now being played out or carried out in visual art. And uh, so, so I'm talking more off the cuff today. I'm, I'm, I'm actually, uh, um, in a way, introducing my contribution by saying that there are, I have a very strong interest in formal issues. I think that training is, uh, and different languages show themselves that dance has got a different kind of uh, form of expression than visual art tends to do, um, and that uh, for work to be able to be re-performed, uh, it's a question of design. Um, and so, so formal issues were really uppermost in my mind, but theoretical issues have become um, something I, I would like to look at today as well, because the framework of this, of our discussion, is the season, which is not only parallel voices, it's not only dance and visual art and performance across different art forms at the moment, it is also Yvonne Rayner and Bruce Nauman and contemporary art. So uh, I hope that we, we can pinpoint what it is that was the different meaning of performance that Yvonne Rayner's work uh, allowed to, uh, to begin to happen. Performance in visual art has a conceptual dimension to it. You've, you often speak of theoretical issues, Isaac, and you, you speak of criticality. And Pablo, your work, I believe, is certainly from looking at uh, some of your two-dimensional work um, is, has, uh, offers old existing material with new, a new take, a new take on existing forms of uh, bodily movement or behavior. Um, well, I'm, I might have to question that later, okay, but okay. I'll, I'll, I'll go along with it. And there may be some, there may be some idea that dance may be, or dance practitioners may be interested in uh, collaborating with and considering visual art context because of its theoretical, um, uh, uh, because of the theoretical dimension of current visual art practice. And that may be something that we, we can question or, or explore. Um, so perhaps we should actually go back to my own earlier instincts, which are literally to ask you both, uh, how do you think of history? Are you engaging with his historical material in your work? What are you each doing differently in staging um, events or uh, experiences for the audience? And what styles of movement? Uh, how is it that your styles of movement are so very different in the material that you work with? Because yours very often, you, you use dance in your work directly. And Isaac, you have used some dance movement, but actually much more uh, a kind of uh, natural movement that is tailored and designed to carry certain meanings as it builds up across your work. So maybe, Pablo, do you want to, could you talk about how you, how you actually work with dancers and how you mm. construct well, um, La Laura uh, girl that was just dancing now, or walking and then posing, uh, is um, not classically trained. Um, and I started to work with um, uh, classically trained ballet dancers because they sort of have this um, inbuilt, um, inherited knowledge that they get handed down to in ballet schools, and this is a, this system of movements, this, this, these series of codes of, of, of behavior um, and of performance relates to a kind of initial interest I had in, in a system of movements that are called sprezzatura um, and that originated in the early 16th century in Italy. And sprezzatura is, uh, to summarize, it's it's the art of embodying aristocratic values within your physical comportment. And um, it, for a while, was for two, three hundred years, the absolute paradigm in, in European behavior, in, in, in court manners, 
Um, it elevated you to a different social status. Um, for example, uh, it was used in uh, paintings, in theatre, as well as in absolutely daily life. Um, I can give you an example of this, um, but I'm, I'm sure you sort of know. I mean, uh, for example, if I was pointing at one of those monitors over there, um, this would be a sprezzatura pose, and this would not be a sprezzatura pose, <laughs> for example. Um, and so that's, um, uh, that's what I started to look at because it seemed to hold a key to why and how camp might exist. What, what is a, a, a sense of uh, queerness in body movements that was around, that is around why acting a certain way is puffy, why it isn't to you know, sit like that, for example. And, and so like all, all, of, all of that stuff it, I started to think about and then I started to, um, well, I mean, I realized that basically Western painting relies on these mannerisms, the Michelangelo's David hands, uh, sorry, um, God creating Adam hands, for example, or the hands of the Mona Lisa that are kind of flopped over like that. These kind of very, very mannered um, physical movements um, are, are really around or were around an awful lot. And, um, and now they exist in certain areas. They exist in gay men um, to some extent. Um, they exist in um, uh, ballet. Um, and they sometimes exist in... Um, uh, when, when people want to show off a kind of elegant turn in one way or another. But they're, but they're things that um, are marginalized, they're sidelined. And at some point um, in the early 19th century, late 18th century, it became very, very clear that these kinds of foppish type behaviors were not what men did. And only very hysterical women that were looked down on overdid that also. And so um, uh, it got codified and, and got stuck in the ballet world, or got left in the ballet world, and it developed within ballet. And so that's where I sort of took it up from, I guess. And that's why I moved into ballet, because from the uh, a Laban perspective, um, a dancer from the Laban might quite easily start to um, think about how the muscle positions might go when I've asked them to, to pose in a certain way. I, I would frequently ask Laura, uh, um, can you raise your right hand? Um, and she would just do this. Um, or ask me where, wh how, how would I do that? And then we'd have to think about what it meant to, to raise your, your right arm or your right hand and, and what muscles were doing what. And, and, it, and then I would ask a ballet dancer, can you raise your right hand and they just do that or whatever the fuck they would do. And, and it just felt like, God, it's so easy. To work with them. Would you be able to describe um, some of your larger events to the audience? Because I'm not sure how many people will have seen them, but I think there's... And, and, and also, if you could describe the relationship or talk about the relationship between the two-dimensional work that I've seen of yours, the, the uh, serious in investigation of, of designs for architecture, and peopling public space. Well, I mean, within, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a very, very big question. I probably can't really answer it. But what I do know is that at heart, there's a question about when, when I choreograph, am I really talking about designing, uh, designing people in a space? Um, and I don't, I don't think I choreograph in a way. Um, uh, I certainly don't choreograph the way Laura choreographs. I, I just tell people where to stand. And, and I normally am very, very dictatorial and tell them um, what to do. And then, and then I rely on the dancers to come up with a series of variations within that. Um, but the, the dance performances take place in public. They're normally uh, comments on public space, on uh, things like um, uh, places like Paternoster Square, which uh, simulates a public piazza, but um, actually, isn't it's privately owned real estate now with shops and you're not allowed to photograph and it's uh, and it simulates this sense of civicness this sense of being uh, an individual that relates to the city rather than a consumer um, and so um, 
uh, that's what the performance downstairs originated from. It was this kind of um, idealized, beautiful state within this idealized piazza. So is there, is there a criticality to it, either in the public events or in the film yes, yes. work? Yes. Um, <laughs> The, the, what, one thing that I found very interesting was that in looking at your uh, publication, which is a, um, one of the publications that you've produced, <laughs> uh, I don't know how many you've produced, but there's this delicious publication called Postmodern Architecture. What I noticed <laughs> was that um, there's a, a, an investigation of those public spaces, which is at the same time appreciative of them and engaged positively with the grandeur of them to some extent, I don't know about the grandeur, but engaged positively with some of the, the, the values and yet critical and, and in fact cynical um, about the, uh, especially in postmodern, about postmodern, the, all the, the use, of, the, the superficial use of, um, archaic forms of design? Well, I mean, I guess one of the, th one of the things that... Um, oh, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, I think, I think one, one of the things that, that um, started off that book was a kind of... Bio a, I felt that I had to adopt a kind of biographical relationship to this architecture, to this kind of Thatcherite and post-Thatcherite architecture. And so one of the things that that has in common with... Um, with the performances and the films I like um, is that they were around, when I was growing up, in a state of um, unfashionability, that they're being revived now, but that somehow um, they were decaying monuments, even when they were almost in their prime somehow. So the work of Peter Greenaway, which is so unfashionable, I'm, I'm amazed that helicopters aren't going to just appear from the sky and shoot me for even mentioning his name. But, I mean, like, for a, for a while, you just couldn't mention him. I mean, Derek Jarman was fucking completely out, wasn't he? For how long? Well, years. 14 years. I mean, like, so it's like, you know, that, that's where, it, that's where it, this kind of stuff comes from. I guess. But there's an interesting criticality, it seems to me, and I must try and define this issue of criticality a bit more, and especially with Isaac, with, with you, I mean, with both of you, but because you're so interested in theoretical issues um, and in, uh, as it were, a kind of, uh, uh, well, a critical position in art making. But it does seem to me that in, in this, in, in your paper, in your work on paper, your, your designs, which are... Um, uh, very spacious representations of large-scale public spaces like piazzas, for example, um, and the intricate detail of some parts of it and the possibility of their decay in this book, in, in any case, in this version of post your critique of most postmodern architecture. There's, a, there's, there's that uh, liking for some of the form and there's, the, and there's a critique of what, the values, of what the values are. And I'm wondering how how that translates to the, the, the events that you stage in public. What is it that you're offering the audience when they encounter your uh, performers, a dozen or so performers in the, uh, in the uh, Javin galleries at the Tate? Um, and how do they encounter them? And also, what, what are you offering your, your audience in New York, in, in Plaza Minuet, in a very grand space? Well, you, you offer a different um, series of behavioural codes that the viewer is confronted with um, and uh, a series of behavioural codes that rely on inactivity as being something that is valued rather than unvalued. Uh, elegance, but without use somehow. It, it's obviously not about a lack of work because dancers work very, very hard to look elegant and to look um, like they're not working. But it's certainly not the same type of behavioral codes that take place when people walk through a busy lobby 
for example, on their way to work. Could you actually just describe a little bit more? Because I haven't seen either the work you did for a performer mm -hmm. in New York or the work you did in, at the Tate and the Juvene Galleries. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very, I, you know, I'd like to be able to imagine them. Mm -hmm. um, oh, okay. So basically, um, me and a troupe of dancers, uh, this is performer. I mean, the Tate was, was something slightly different. Performer, we um, created this grid on top of the map of New York City. We chose four locations, four public lobbies within private buildings. It's a long architectural story, but anyway, these things exist. Um, Large-scale postmodern extravaganzas. Um, we took, um, say, uh, 20 dancers from location to location. Um, with the dancers, we laid some tape um, in the form of a square with a cross intersecting that. Um, and this motif is a reduced version of a minuet format, um, a minuet grid. It's also a emblem of um, an architectural void. And there is where the comment comes in about the public space, what lies underneath that space, who owns it, for example. Um, and then uh, we would get all the dancers in there in bright green leotards or turquoise leotards, and me or me and a assistant choreographer would sit in chairs and shout abuse at the dancers or directions at the dancers and tell them what to correct. Um, the, the version on film downstairs is like a kind of mild version of that. Normally, I'd perform more about trying to get the vision correct somehow. From, from an idealized theatrical perspective, I hasten to add. Yes, and obviously there is a, a particular, um, I mean, the, the question of, of a particular viewpoint or vision is in the film installation downstairs. I don't know if exactly. you've seen yes. But just to go back for a second to the experience of the audience in the public event, would they encounter these, um, these, these uh, movements by chance? Um, they, it was notified that this performance would take place, mm -hmm. um, but, um, most people didn't know it was taking place. Yep. Um, they would just turn up. Um, but, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know if that necessarily is something that I've really resolved, actually. I think that that's something that I'm, I'm going to have to really rethink, that the, the, the position of ambulation in relation to these performances is something that I think needs some thinking about. And in terms of moving into using film now, if that is a development in your work, mm. um, does this offer the different... Are you working differently? Well, I mean, one of the things that I, I discover is that downstairs, the same question arises about where people stand. Um, and so, ideally, um, it, would have been, it would be really great to um, have thought about the piece, or we can maybe rethink the piece, to have it projected so that the projectors aren't in the middle of the room, but somehow projected. I mean, I know it's an expensive process to deal with this, but I, you know, ideally, the open space between or in front of these four views would be, um, would be open for uh, perambulation. I hasten to add that the four views downstairs are not um, four angles. There are, there are three views. One is just higher than the other mm. somehow. It's One of them seems to be a, a privileged framed viewpoint where the, where the, the design of the movement and the, and the tableaus is very beautiful, rather yeah. like paintings, and the others seem to be more casual. Yeah. In fact, the documentation, in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. Framing and staging is is an issue that that is obviously kind of an aesthetic issue as well. For I mean, it's different in in your work, for example, how things are framed. But just before Isaac, I don't know if I can ask you a few things, but but I wanted to ask you about the the use of this early form of movement. Uh, as well as there being a personal agenda and interest in it, in terms of how that style of movement that historically can be uh, reclaimed by you. Uh, some well, sense. I mean, what else is it? Why? Well, I, d I don't sort of. I mean, my my interest in this arose from books, and that's also why I now don't work with Baroque trained dancers, mm. because they have a very very rigorous rigorous academic approach. Some, some of them do, the ones I've worked with. And they've been very good dancers, but uh, it feels textbook um, somehow. It doesn't feel like the language has developed to a point where it's recognized as beyond the book. It's, it's not quite dance somehow. It feels less than that. But um, one of the things that I was, I, I was going to say was that I, all of this recreation stuff, I mean, it is 
just that. It's a, it's a creation again. I mean, it's, it's not something that exists as a, a real historical document. I mean, it's, I mean, I'm quite interested in all of these fantasies of, of history that, that exist in, in, in the contemporary world, like the, the myth of period instruments in, in classical music, where we have to listen to Bach, St. Matthew's Passion, performed by, I don't know, you know, three stray cats and a harpsichord, because that's the way it was done then. And, and then you think, but it's a record. You know, it's a CD. What am I listening to? It's an absolute modern fantasy of, of, of history. Um, there is no such thing as the authentic experience. And, and so when I work with these movements, they are really um, ways of thinking about um, uh, our behavior now. I'm not so interested in, in exact historical reenactment. They're very beautiful. I remember you saying that you, you designed the movements of the dancers to, according to shapes that you liked. Yeah. Which sounds like paintings to yeah, me. Yeah, absolutely. But at the same time, there's a, the critical aspect of it is that they, they are not useful. They're leisure, something about not being useful and... Not well, the, 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 this, this movement comes from a time in which power derived from the ability to not have to work. So aristocrats developed this because it showed that they never really lifted a shovel you know, a day in their lives. They were very, very manicured. Well, that was the look you were going for. It was manicured. And so um, that's why this movement derives or relies on a lack of effort. It, it derives from um, an aristocratic system of power and government. Um, and, um, yeah. Well... Um Perhaps, perhaps, I mean, I, I'm still, I have something in the back of my mind about what Yvonne Rayner means to both of you, but uh, do you want to say anything about that now? Or, or? Well, I mean, I, I guess the, the pedestrian aspect sort of relates to Yvonne Rayner, because I mean, I'm, I'm interested, just as I'm interested in the, the conventional, the, the conventions of supposedly another era or, or thinking about um, other conventions that we can we can create as fantasies. Now, I'm also interested in this kind of myth of the pedestrian um, and juxtaposing that with other things. And in fact, the crucial thing about, to understand for me about her work is that it was uh, uh, breaking down the inherited ritual forms of, of dance to some extent and, and making use of ordinary movement. But at the same time, that became uh, highly developed and specialized, so it's not uh, just ordinary movement. It's it's highly it's it's practiced and refined. Um, yes. Isaac, would you like to explain um, how you understand the choreographic imagination, or how it plays a part in your work? Because one of the key differences between your work and Pablo's is the fact that you use film, but you do use it on a panoramic scale. So you, you do involve the audience in a physical way in their experience of um, the images you're presenting, but, but also you investigate history, a cultural history, I think, in a very, uh, with a very different set of concerns, actually. Um, and what would you like to... What would you like me to ask you? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I think um, the discussion has been incredibly interesting and illuminating because I think, um, you know, if, if one's thinking about architecture, I think there's always this sort of um, contestatory position. You know, when you come to film a space and a location, there's a sort of translation process and a reading against what may be the sort of authorial kind of intentions, you know, of a space, you know, and I think there's always this kind of inversion that one wants to perform, you know. There's a kind of reverie in the fact that, you know, these spaces take on, as it were, a place for a certain pleasure in, you know, and the kind of field is a space where, you're, where you want to kind of perhaps reimagine a presence, you know. So if I think about a piece of work like Vagabondia, which was shot in the Sir John Stern Museum, 
um, which is in the Tate Collection. We based that piece of work was very much about the sort of repositioning um, what could be a phantasmatic way of reviewing the space and bringing out what would be, as it were, the repressed aspects of modernities in that space, you know, by kind of presenting, as it were, sort of figures or certain sort of, um, you know, bodies, you know, identities that may not be associated with it in a sort of historical sense. Um, but certainly in this piece of work, on the left, Conservative's Dream, which was the first piece of work, really, that I collaborated with dancers and choreographers on, B.B. Miller and Ralph Lemon, was really about how one would sort of translate what was um, a kind of duet into a, another medium, namely that of film, and then really thinking about really the sort of histories around video art in constructing the piece of work. And, um, and particularly, I, I was very interested in the use of the, the, the question of time, because it seems to me that it's time um, when it comes to, as it were, representing performance on film, which changes our relations as an audience um, in terms of its perception. And particularly in relationship to the conservative dream, I was really thinking about the relationship to photography so the relationship to the still image and the moving image and how, as it were, kind of these new technologies really impact on the way in which we kind of view materials and how they translate time into other mediums um, of expression, you know. And so I think sort of there's this sort of aspect um, as well as the kind of formal qualities. And then, of course, there's my own interests um, which is an interest in conceptual ideas which are married with, as it were, the kind of um, jissance with a certain pleasure, with a certain idea of thinking about the ways in which you might um, bring together what could be seen as incongruous ways of sort of thinking. So it's thinking both conceptually but also with this idea of pleasure, you know, or driving what could be seen as, um, you know, this area of seduction, you know. So I think it's that kind of reverie um, that, you, what, that one wants to develop in a kind of critical sense, you know. So, it's, so it becomes neither or, you know. So I think, you know, if, if, if I think about the previous generation, that's perhaps, you know, where I can see a kind of turn, as it were, in relationship to kind of, you know, those sort of more early investigations. Um, video art. Of video art, yes. You know, there is a medium which is kind of, you know, at the forefront of recording performance and in a way using time in a different sense to say cinema and sort of, as it were, making that sort of translation between the sort of object and non-object and this sort of question of performance that's kind of centrally being relocated, you know. So um, I think that the, those sorts of ideas um, sort of, yeah. It sounds to me when you say that, that, that time as a, as a material to be aware of is operating on, a, on, a, on an internal and imaginative level. I don't know if that's actually what you mean, but um, one of the things that's been interesting me in, th in thinking about these issues and in the context of uh, dance practice and visual art practice, it, one, of the, one of the things that I've been thinking about is whether, whether one's being affected as a viewer on a, or as an art, a, a maker on an interior imaginative level or, um, or whether you are, whether one is, you are, you are dealing with things that, that obviously operating on that level too, but, but, but where you're more aware of, of negotiation um, in, in, uh, of the public dimension. Um, I haven't put that very well, but when you talk about time, it, it does seem to suggest that to me. Well, I, I, well, you know, in the case of um, you know, this work, I'm really thinking about the question of synchronicity, you know, that really kind of at play sort of in the work is really um, the question of that, and then the question of, as it were, the use of multi-screen works, you know, and so I do have an argument where basically I do think 
that the idea of multitasking, the way that sort of new technologies have impacted on the way that we think about vision have really, in a way, been one of the reasons why we've seen, as it were, this return to the notion of, a, of an expanded cinema in the visual arts, but with a different accent. You know, and the accent belongs to the way in which sort of time and technology has impacted on the artist's subjectivity. And so I think, you know, this kind of repositioning, the way that kind of the, the multi-use of angles, you know, um, and that sort of way of sort of reinscribing the space architecturally, you know, is something which has only been available through projection, it's only been available through really this kind of simulacrum kind of use of the cinematic, you know, because of course the, this is not cinema, this is a post-cinematic aspect which one's been involved in. And it seems to me that it's precisely then this use of the body where it's a use of the body in a kind of non-traditional sense that has attracted you know, artists to, as it were, sort of dance and this reinvention of the choreographic um, imagination, which I... Can, yeah. Sorry, so you're exploring. Yes, you've always been exploring. But can you talk about the styles of movement that you uh, ask that you use that your performers perform different styles of movement in the imaginary spaces that you create through the filmic work now, what's so amazing to me about pablo's kind of historical kind of readings of investigations around movement um, is really you know it explains to me some of the things where one's been working with choreographers and dancers and they'll talk about the movement but then it would be this idea of none effort, you know, in this movement, you know. And I think about that in relationship to the kind of work um, of Ivan Rain and this is, you know, kind of um, appropriation of the everyday in movement as a sort of break at that particular moment. But I, I think in relationship to um, the works which I've been involved in, it's really been about this sort of translation of movement and I've really taken my sort of, um, in this particular moment of this work which was made in 1998, um, between 96 to 98, I, I was really interested in um, Maya Deren and that notion of time that she was exploring with the body in her kind of cinematic works, you know, which were involved in a sort of, um, in a certain surrealistic kind of movement um, around time. And I think sort of, um, for me, I was really interested in, in making that become something which was going to be spatialized, in By a sense. The, the three screen installation, By, yes. yes. I mean, mentioning Maya Deren is interesting because of course she did work very closely with dancers and studied uh, dance in her work and, and studied ways of, I mean, achieved ways of uh, working with the movement uh, of the body by a dancer uh, with the camera to, so that the, the two were, were continuous. Um, Precisely, because I think, you know, the place, the place of the camera um, in relationship to the body, you know, the question of lighting, the question of timing, and of course then there's a question of montage. And precisely the Eisensteinian notion of a montage of attractions was one of the things which was really interesting in terms of translating that sort of way of thinking across, as it were, kind of in a kind of spatial sense, you know. So kind of a montage of attraction becomes a montage of editing, if you like, you know, it becomes Can this... Can you that a bit more, montage well, of attraction? the montage of attraction is simply about, um, you know, the positioning when you're editing images uh, or movement that you would place one action against another and then put something impossible in between that produces a sort of third sort of reading, you know, or produces a third meaning that produces something that could be uncanny or, mm -hmm. but, you know, produces ag against the kind of intentions of the filmed sort of intentions of that environment, environment yeah. precisely, you know, and so, um, that sort of philosophy really um, of thinking then about time, you know, that film reintroduces in performance, I think, is something that's, you know, been of interest. 
Right, and and so my down as well is working with layers of uh, with the imagine with 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 the imagination with with yes very much with the imagined uh, scene. Um, I'm wondering, what I'm particularly interested in in your work in, in this context is asking you about the fact that you, you have worked with dancers and there's a very vivid example of uh, dancers' movement being strange and particular and very evocative in, for example, uh, a Vagabond in the Sloan Museum where, it, where the dancer there is working as a kind of rupture into that historical space. Um, or in Journey to Mazatlan, where although there's something slightly more natural about it, there's also definitely the, the stylization, the, the trained movement is apparent, and it's very it's expressive in a kind of metaphorical way. Um, but do you think that what I'm actually particularly interested in is the movement that you've been, uh, or the performers you've been working with more recently? and in your more recent work in the large-scale installations, and I don't know if ev everyone here has seen them or not, but um, where it's not actually dance, it's actually uh, the, 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 your, your performers are walking. So I wonder, could you talk about that and whether that is the kind of, is that, I mean, I see, is that an odd element in the way that you were just describing the montage of attractions where there's something else? that comes in there that actually separates your composing, as, as of you, composing of the scene, or, uh, because I've seen it until now as being an avatar for yourself, you know, a via, that um, Vanessa Myrie, who who's has the most extraordinarily beautiful post, composed posture, who walks through these landscapes, and these uh, cultural environments that you investigate, I've seen her as, someone who's carrying your own gaze through those environments. And similarly, the, the, the male figure who, who erupts in a kind of wild way, I, I see as, as a form of avatar as well. In other words, a kind of viewing on behalf of you, but literalized for us as an audience. Um, no, I think that's a sort of excellent reading, because I think in a way, it's precisely then um, the kind of use of the choreographic to embody certain subjective positions. And I think this question of viewing um, through these movements uh, is very, very important. I mean, in the Vagabondia piece, I was very much thinking about the undoing of the archive, and it was precisely through this kind of use of the body, you know, that one was undoing that. There are all these other different notions around the question of the character that the dancer was based on, which was on a sort of 18th century black beggar um, who was quite famous, who wore a ship on his head um, while he was begging, and so he's incredibly famous. And in really London. think, in London, and then thinking about this choreographic and how you might translate this kind of nautical metaphor into the choreographic. And so there are all these kinds of ideas, but I think in relationship to the Vanessa Mari character and the use of the body, it's really thinking about non-acting, it's thinking about Bresson, it's thinking about the ways in which you might investigate movement which, would, which is impregnated with this kind of viewing aspect. And this is where the use of the modern screen works become very important. And also, as you say, the, the presence of, um, sort of Vanessa Mai who performs this kind of viewing, um, inserting this kind of cosmopolitan transnational subjectivity um, into the kind of positioning. I might just ask, has anyone seen Isaac's recent works, uh, Phantom Afrique or True North, um, or Baltimore? Well, these are, these are works that I'm, I'm really referring to, which, which I don't know if you, perhaps you don't need to describe them anymore, but they, or perhaps you could just quickly describe what the audience would see if they... Well, Baltimore is essentially um, a piece of work which involves... Um, it, was, it was originally going to be called an ideal city because it's based on a painting from the school of Pera della Francesca. And this painting hangs in the Waters Art Gallery. And the fantastic thing about it is the way it introduces a kind of perspective for the first time in Western sort of, you know, European painting. And 
Baltimore um, is the city where this museum exists, and I had been invited to make a piece of work where I would collaborate with three other institutions. And I found this other fantastic institution called the Great Blacks in Wax Museum, and decided to put the black wax works from this collection inside the space of the Waters Art Museum, which has a, re a fantastic Renaissance gallery and uh, Italian masters, et cetera, et cetera. And so really it was about the kind of frisson that would be created in this kind of juxtaposition, but also the use of CGI with Vanessa Myrie's character as a cyborg and choreographing these movements in CGI really across the free screens and into the space and out of the space was really also part of its language, along with Melvin Van Peebles, who made the first black exploitation film called Sweet Sweet Back, Sweet Sweet Back it's about our Song. It was a sort of iconic figure who becomes, which I make a waxwork double, uh, which so in the end. So I mean, they're, it's, they're very complicated, but they're very much about architecture, about the choreographic being not just about movement of bodies, but also about the way in which sound is used and sonically reproduced in the space of the installation um, and the, the kind of mise-en-scene between the, the, the editing of the screens themselves. There's an enormously complex choreography in your filmmaking, in the camera work, in the fluid, I mean, uh, also extremely high production values. So there's a great lusciousness about the image and about the scene that is portrayed. Um, but there's a, a fluid camera movement, um, this extraordinary experience of watching an image move across three screens or of being uh, surrounded effectively almost by the sound and the image as a viewer in these enorm la enormous three screen installations really. Um, and yes, the choreograph a choreographic imagination in terms of the aesthetics of the, of the camera work. I think is a very, very strong element as you as your as you're showing of, of your work. Um, and then of course, yes, how how the body itself uh, is used within that is another is another layer of it. But it does interest me that the, the, that if you have that if you have that viewer on your behalf as it were, or performer, someone who's performing a cultural presence, I think, and a historic, a, a, a cultural, a, a, a Vanessa Myrie as a, 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 a slightly ambiguous female figure, not ambiguous, a, a, a surprising female figure, walks through many environments that you have been investigating in the last few years in your work, I believe. And um, I've assumed that she is doing two things. One is that she is viewing, and that is an active, you know, that's an active statement, and it's also what you're investigating. But also, she is making visible her presence uh, as a viewer. But th that is a form of, of a cultural, uh, I'm not sure what the word is now, but a, a cultural uh, rebalancing or, or a, you know, a, 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 and making something visible that has not been, that's been neglected. So I've always seen a kind of politics in that. Yeah. And the difference between her movement, her quiet, composed <laughs> movement through African in, uh, landscapes and in True North in Antarctica, uh, and in Baltimore, where she walks through this museum of black wax works uh, within a very uh, Renaissance surrounding, as you say, and then performs this 21st century set of flips up to the ceiling, <laughs> and you know, very dynamic. It's, there's a very, very different use of movement there. Um, and well, I, I mean, in a way, I think, you know, it, there's very much the sort of idea of um, a transtextual sort of character as well, that, you know, from each piece of work, you can build on the quotation of the presence, as it were, in the same way that sort of Hollywoodian stars build their presences, as it were, across the number of films that they might feature in. You know, so I think, you know, I mean, there have been other artists, and we haven't really mentioned Matthew Barney very much, but I mean, I do think that he's been sort of at work in doing not something similar, but I mean, certainly resonating um, 
his persona in a transtextual sense across the Crane Master series. Um, and I think, you know, I can even see some sort of mutations, you know, at work in Pablo's kind of work in this sort of um, reappropriation of these autocratic gestures um, and the way in which, you know, these, you know, gestures are very much alive and well, as it were, um, and not always celebrated in this different uncanny sense. Well, I actually do think that there's something strange about them as well, which is what I was trying to ask sort of 10 minutes ago was, um, was uh, is, it, is, is there something strange about those figures walking through? Why does it seem so... I'm you know, interested in this idea of the montage of attractions, of, of, the, of the different element that uh, kind of breaks the composition that one would expect there to be. But is that something you're consciously working with? Well, I think certainly you want to think about the ways in which you can sort of, as it were, sort of break through the fourth wall that you're, you know, in, I think in terms of her persona and certainly in terms of um, the works, it's very much about, as it were, sort of creating, and I have all these theories about it, a creolized subjectivity, Etc., which take quite a long time to explain, but it's very much about the, sort of this cosmopolitan sort of subjectivity, which is displaced, you know, which represents a lot of, you know, what some subjects experience and may go through, you know, and that's a question of displacement um, in this technologically produced moment, I think, is something that we're sort of all experiencing to a certain degree. Asking you was whether it was about a, a in, in fact, in some sense, a black cultural, um, um, or yes, a cultural presence that you wanted to not 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 the presence of the person so much as a a set of references and, uh, and a, a, a whole his imagination that is being that you're that is being brought into play through the body. I, in I mean, these landscapes. Yeah, I mean, most certainly, but I think, you know, that sort of, you know, we can think about Eastern Europeans, you can think about, you know, the fact that, you know, Western Europe's going to be displaced by China pretty soon. Um, you know, so I think, you know, we're all going to inherit these different sort of positionalities to a certain degree um, in different sorts of ways, you know, in a kind of space where ecologically, you know, we're all on the same planet, but, you know, the ice is melting, but so what, you know, cultural differences rage on, you know, so I, mean, I think, no, I, mean, I totally agree, um, mm. Helena, with, um, with Well, you're that saying that we've moved on beyond that, actually, beyond my question, I think. In, um, as far as I understand it, from parts of reading Catherine's book, the criticality in Yvonne Rainer's work was uh, partly to do with the fact that she was uh, working with a group of people to perform patterns of movement um, that had an aspect of working out the movement as it was being performed. Uh, it's not the best way of saying it, but um, and that it was not so much about uh, the an interior imagination. So I'm, I, that's such a, a bad summing up, but basically the, the, the criticality is about um, presenting something uh, where there is a, a, an example of social interaction and that that is her objective, as well as obviously the desire that Catherine, you've mentioned as being a motivating force in her shaping some of these movements. But the, the example of different social interaction is, let's say, the, the, the useful criticality about her innovation in dance choreography. Um, and that seems to me different than the critical position that you're taking in employing a, a subjectivity. So I just, I wanted to try and explore that actually. I don't know if any of these um, questions are, you know, how they relate to dance, uh, dancers or choreographers. Um, 
I mean, I think sort of, you know, just as an example of sort of, you know, how sort of, you know, visual artists, um, you know, are thinking and also writers um, about this whole notion of the choreographic. But of course, you know, we're very interested to know from, you know, this other view, you know, because of course we've been talking about the choreographic, but there is an object in the choreographic. You know, there is a body. <laughs> There is someone, you know, who is sort of, you know, performing. So, um, and of course, we have an audience in front of us, and we've been sort of um, enjoying our conversation. But perhaps maybe you might want to, um, you know, tell us maybe what you what you think, and we could open this up. Yeah. There is a microphone. Um, well, I'm I'm not a dancer or a choreographer, but I kind of wanted to pick up on a point that you kind of started with at the beginning. Something I've been thinking about all the while. You've been sort of having your discussion. Is it coming from a sort of a, a sort of a visual art background, where we sort of continuously have all these kind of discussions about, so sort of endlessly about sort of the histories and blah 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 blah. I just wanted to know if anybody sort of from the audience that's a, that comes from a sort of a dance background, where that same kind of thing happens, where you endlessly sort of go over what you might do, what's happened before, you sort of how you uh, respond to other people's work, you know, sort of where you fit in historically amongst everything else, whether this kind of discussions happen or, or, or not, because I'm, I'm very interested. Do the so. same, so the question is, do the same discussions about a, a lineage, a heritage of art practice? And either on a formal uh, or or a theoretical level, do they take place as well in the dance world? Is that the question? Yeah. Can anyone answer that? <laughs> yeah, I think that definitely it does go on, and then in a way, it would be odd that it wouldn't go on. I mean, it would be strange as a choreographer, a dance maker, not to take account of your lineage and what had happened before and what place you are making, what mark you're making, and et cetera. So in a way, of course, those conversations go on. Then maybe the, the kind of um, issue that dancers or choreographers tend to go around maybe too much is the idea that dance doesn't exist in space and time as an object in space, and this whole question about objects in space that you can kind of grapple with and go back into that gallery and look at the lineage and see it all there for yourself is the question that dancers keep going around as the fact that we don't have it here, and what we have is some record to some extent poorly made or not, depending on which period we're talking about, as to something that we can all go back and literally look at. So what we're relying on is text, and what we're relying on is Von Rainer's fantastic book, which, you know, records her thinking about the makings of those works and we have it kind of second hand so that's what we deal with but in a way that's a very creative prospect so you work with that and that's um, all positive so you know we should deal less with the fact that if the ephemerality the ephemeral nature of dance should be discarded because in a sense that's the very nature of the beast so that's what we take and take hold of I think that's certainly one of the issues that's been facing curators in the visual art world or artists who are working in, with an interest in performance in visual art, uh, which, which by nature is ephemeral also, and which was recorded oh, yeah, in a, a definitely. variety of ways. Yes, it's, it's kind of, it's not an, un, you know, it's, it's there all the time. Um, and certainly a very interesting question, I think, you asked that. Um, it has been mentioned, this idea of history, and um, I think what I find very interesting is that um, as a visual artist, I mean, I'm both a visual artist and a dance artist, and as a visual artist, there is a lot of uh, historical references and that you could say are direct references, like when you look at a painting or look at architecture or sculpture. As a dancer, uh, you have very, very few uh, direct references. Um, and most of them are even indirect, or um, in the case of uh, the kind of movements that Pablo was referring to, uh, it's a very specific kind of dance. And I think what interests me very much is, is um, how, through dance, uh, we can uh, 
approach history or how do how we can uh, somehow i don't know find out about the mysteries of that history that is not there for us to to deal with and um i think visual arts like literature um, are very suitable for an academic approach in which you kind of research, um, find things and put them in a box, and then there is a kind of established uh, idea of what is acceptable and what is not, and what is good art and what is not. Uh, I think in dance, you have this thing of that dance has been going on for, for thousands of years, but there is no direct history of dance that we can deal with uh, as artists, I think. And I don't know, I'm very interested about that and, and how people could can approach that or how people look at that. Um, there was also a very specific question for Pablo, and is that uh, in the kind of movement that you were dealing with, there was a, an implicit sense or idea of power. And when you are choreographing, you're saying that yourself are putting yourself in a position of power, of being very dictatorial. And whether that has a political reading for you or how, how do you look at it? Um, so they're kind of two different questions. Yeah, yeah, it, it does. But I mean, it, I don't think it has an easy, an easy logic to it. Um, I, I can't, I can't describe that. I, I, I can't describe what I do and then say I want to do this with it. Um, they're all strands of my practice that kind of weave in and out. And so there are performances in which this authority figure is not present somehow and in which the dancer's own sense of um, uh, comportment of learnt poses of inherited um, movement um, from the academies and so on is their own authority. And so that, that, um, that also varies a lot. But um, in a way, the, the, kind of, um, the kind of art that is produced when artists research um, it is normally considered interesting when artists transform their materials. Um, and it is not considered that interesting. It's almost not even considered enough art. There's, there's not much there when artists simply present uh, historical research. And so, I mean, there are, of course, exceptions to this. But, but I, in a way, I, I don't think that it's it's a simple case of, of artists having endless terrain and then simply um, can present it. They need to represent it. They need to do something with it somehow. And, and they may have very big problems in that, in that effort. The question of history and uh, an available history does tie into the fact that, um, that you have a visual history of dance through which, for example, uh, Pablo has been able to reconstruct or, or make use of. I mean, there, there, are, there are other dimensions rather than, yes, the artworks themselves are only there when they're re-performed, aren't they? I and mean, that's one of the extraordinary things. You have a range, though, of, of sources that give you the history, although, yes, you, you can't be there. For me, it's gone. I think um, one of the big things is like reading a description of a painting uh, that's 300 years old. Reading a description of a painting has to tell you anything about the painting. And it's a very similar thing with dance. You have people who tell, talk to you about what a form of dance was like. But dance, I mean, even a video is a full record of the dance experience. And important issue that we don't have the references to earlier forms of dance and, and how do we deal with that? Well, I think maybe you're talking about that as having a bearing on, on its critical its critical dimension, its theoretical dimension. You're say, perhaps you're saying that, whereas I th think it's one of the extraordinary thing about, things about the performing arts, the performing arts, is that they have to be done again. They, they, they have to be represented in order to be present. And that gives an opportunity either for uh, understanding the design of the piece or for reinterpretation, so for new, new meanings. Um, I yeah. think it's also worth saying that the question of ephemerality, you know, is also in a way 
I mean, it's become really very important. And I think, you know, um, that's, as I said, I think there has been this case of um, the sort of practices which are developing at this particular moment um, of globalization, which is sort of against the object to a certain degree. And I think that's something that's been sort of been quite exciting. You know, there's been a kind of turn, if you like. And I think, in a way, um, I think, you know, that of course, on that Yvonne Rayner, who will be, you know, um, with us quite soon, you know, someone who has represented histories of choreographic um, sort of movement and dance within her own work, although she's working on a new piece now. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, but this question of the kind of moment, I think, is something that's really, you know, something that's been, you know, very exciting, really. Um, and also, yeah. you're, because you're talking about ephemerality from, and that, there was a specific point there about the market, I think, and I don't want to just close it down to that, but there was a point there about the market. And what I've understood from the uh, practice that Yvonne Rayner was doing, which is, I wanted to <laughs> actually just go back to your earlier question, uh, well, my question to you about the inheritance for visual art of, of Yvonne Rayner's analysis, analysis, and whether that that, anal that an analysis of, uh, of everyday uh, behavior that's negotiated between people is also there in contemporary dance practice. That, that was my question, really, not whether or not she's left a legacy in terms of disciplinary vocabulary, but whether she's left a legacy for dancers to critique everyday behavior. Because that is what I think, on one level, visual artists can be doing, just as Pablo was doing in this book, criti critiquing architecture. That was my question, and yours is your. It's not the same as, as your your concern with with the pleasure and the other intuitions at the same time, but and a number of things there. Uh, yeah, one, I'm thinking coming back to the his, the question of history that I think dance has its history, but it's sort of implicit in the movement. And Pablo, what you were saying very early on, you know, you were saying something like the the, the movement is built into the dancers, which is of course is is hilarious because they're they're learning it. You know, and then they're building this history into themselves. And so I think in dance there's some as generally or e often a struggle to be, to create a distance then again from this to this history which you've built into yourself. And I think that's where visual arts is really, um, has a way to offer something to, or kind of where this um, intersection happens that Yvonne Rayner did, where she stripped somehow or, or took a distance to the history of dance so that we can again look at the body and, and ask this question of who is this body and what does it mean to sit down and stand up? You know, and, and I think it's a sort of questioning of something which visual arts can do, which is to do with creating a distance. Um, but I think the history is there and the problem is that in, in dance the history is implicit and, and in visual arts it's more easily for a kind of explicit history, I think. So one of the things that's quite interesting is uh, a notion of uh, uh, differing notions of, of, of the body when an artist uses dance or choreographs and, and, and very often when, when a dancer choreographs. I mean, I'm finding it very, very tricky sometimes to speak about uh, choreography and, and, and dancers because I'm, I'm not one. Um, but um, I know that within art, it is very difficult to have tabula rasa. Um, it is very difficult to get to zero level. Um, in, in dance, from what I understand, the aim before dance is tabula rasa, and then dance creates on top of that, is beyond that. But with, um, with contemporary art, because of its very, very long-standing relationship to photography, to um, political art and so on, there is no such thing as a body that isn't already codified into a series of... Um, meanings that are, that are so weighed down with associations. Um, I, also, I also have a, um, sometimes I, I mean, I, I, I don't know very much about Yvonne Rayner's work, but very often I'm, I, I, I think people very often are interested in historical figures um, within the art world for their aesthetic qualities. And it wouldn't be unfair to mention fashion at this point. 
not in terms of Yvonne von Rainer being fashionable because still not, not that many people know about her in the art world and in fact some of the people that have been instrumental in bringing her into more prominence are actually sitting in this room but uh, I, I definitely think that there is a very superficial engagement with people like Yvonne Rayner in the art world, um, mostly based on uh, the, the grain, the, the feel of, of the film, um, the uh, clothes they might be wearing. This came up in last week's, uh, dis uh, last, uh, the last discussion about um, uh, uh, Nauman, about this, um, this question of, oh, he was just wearing the clothes he was wearing and he went to a studio and filmed. And of course, from our perspective, that's impossible. Everything becomes this um, series of theatrical staging. Certainly within the art world, it would be impossible to think of someone thinking that streetwear, nothing much, is just jeans and T-shirts because we've all grown up with Levi's adverts and we know what jeans and T-shirts means it means that we're probably more likely to have sex than if we turn up in a ball gown or whatever it is but we know we know that there there are codes towards these these sorts of these sorts of visual trappings and and sometimes those visual trappings become incredibly seductive and relevant and I, i'm very suspicious of the art world's grappling with those figures i'm suspicious of my own interest in postmodernism for that reason so but i think there are different histories of of reception um, in different cities. You know, so I think if you think about the art world in New York, if you think about the language that has been developed and the spaces that have been um, sort of, um, which have grown um, for the appreciation of that language. I, mean, I don't think there's a superficial engagement with Yvonne Rayner in the art world, in, for, I mean, from a New York perspective, you know, but I do, you know, and I think the question of expediency, you know, of course, is always at hand. But I do think, you know, that you know, there might be other instances where the, the kind of political interventions which she wants to make, you know, I think are ones which are very important. And there is great resistance, um, you know, in the dance world, in fact, um, rather than the art world. I mean, I think it's been vice versa, you know, that the, the art world has in, been invitational in relationship to the criticality and, and the sort of artistic practice which she represents. Um, you know, there is resistance, you know, for showing that work in the kind of setting which it deserves to be seen, you know, um, you know, certainly in this city. So I think, you know, in a way, I mean, there are different histories for different cities. Mm. But I, I, I totally agree. But I also, I also should should make it clear that by superficial, I don't mean shallow, or I don't mean that necessarily in a, in a negative sense. I mean an obsession with surface, more than anything else. to Julian's um, uh, introduction uh, to talking about your work. I was just really interested in your comments when you attributed the, um, the increased visibility of performance in traditional art spaces to um, a rejection of, of the idea of um, uh, art as mar marketable objects um, and a return to ideas, which I think would be fantastic. But um, I wondered if it couldn't just as easily be seen as part of the more widespread um, current move towards um, audience immersive or experiential art, which is just as marketable as object art and is actually, in my mind, it's no more inherently conceptual than, I don't know, the, the sort of work that you're talking about, a rejection. It is marketable counts. financially. Well, I don't know if you go to the kind of events, um, like the sort of Fluxus event at the Tate recently, but there's... I think it's very, there's something that's very marketable about those um, and um, uh, kind of Anthony Gormley work, things like that. There's something that's very marketable, marketable about experiential work that I think is something that I've seen recently. Well, I think you know, that's an interesting point. I mean, I think that, you know, but I think that, you know, in a way, there has been this return to the performative. Um, of course, you know, people are involved 
in marketing that, but I don't think that necessarily explains the sort of interest in relationship to that as a phenomena. You know, I think there is something else, perhaps, you know, that's been reinvestigated um, in the visual arts in this moment around those sorts of, you know, but of, of course, there's, you know, there's this sort of audience pleasing, you know, create a cue, kind of have this kind of sensation, this experiential, visceral kind of relationship to art, um, you know, that has, of course, been cynically marketed. I mean, I, you know, I mean, I agree, but I think, you know, that doesn't ne necessarily do away with the intentionality, I think, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, but you know, one could be cynical about it. <laughs> Can I just ask one last question? Really, is that is does, does it, would a dance uh, uh, community feel that there was a necessity to have the kind of uh, critical analysis of social mores which I'm preoccupied with today in terms of what I think Yvonne Le Rayner's legacy is to visual art? Is it, is it the same thing in dance? Is there a, an agenda to, to, uh, to offer different ways of operating socially? Yeah, I think there is a lot of people working on that right now, and um, and that for me is a is a way of dealing with with that sociological aspect of dance. And I think there is so many very highly trained dancers around that uh, some people enjoy going to a theater and, and watching a very highly trained dancer doing something amazing. But I think there are also lots of experiences of people who are working with communities and and just trying to to create experiences that people can make their own. And, that, um, and I think that's why I was referring to history before, because I think history is something that you can look at and learn, whereas um, when you have a, I think a dance experience is a body experience, is something that you can internalize and, and experience in a way in which you're not gonna be able to, through a, to do through a, a book or of, about history of art or things like that. So I think there is, there is an element of that in, in the dance world, and, uh, or at least that's how I see it, I don't know. very well in this country, I think. It, maybe I would make a distinction between that and not that there isn't a crossover, because there is, of work that involves the body in a more open-ended, if we can say that, way in, 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 in relation to so-called training. And we can get into a whole semantic about what that is, what training is, because post Yvonne Rayner, there was a whole opening up of what we call new dance and a whole kind of uh, cycle of events that happened in America that came over here, that we then generated a whole kind of community of dance makers over here in the 70s, 80s, that were looking at the expression of the body through, um, if, you, if you like, a more direct and so-called pedestrian way, but I use that word visedly, in order to allow oneself to kind of, to shake off the cloak of so-called technique training, which, is, which all comes from, you know, yes, ballet, most dancers, a lot of dancers start through the ballet training and, like you were saying, trying to work their way to unload that in that in inherited history to try and find an actual, really what it's about is a more honest material that is about making and expressing oneself through one's art. You know, it's about trying to find a language, really, which is what Yvonne Rainey was doing, is what, what came post that. And in this country, if you had Rosemary Butcher's work, for example, who was very much working with so-called pedestrian movement in the... 70s and 80s, and d developed that away and worked with non, so-called non-dancers, 
then working very much with quite technically trained dancers, but in a more, if you like, uh, how to say it, but in a more naturalistic, I'll put it that way, way, you know, and so on. So there's, there is, I don't know if that answers your previous question when you were asking about the critiquing, of the, but, but there is a, a whole kind of gamut of work that has con, come post with Von Rainer, and it's in a way she gave us the permission to say, it doesn't have to be like this. And in a sense, we're always going do, trying to do that, give yourself the permission that it doesn't have to be like this. So I don't know if that answers, uh, that fills in for you. Well, I can, if, I don't know if anybody else, because there are some other dance people here, I'm sure. Because I'm, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Part she answers it. Maybe it's also just to say that there's a whole group of um, artists around Yvonne Rayner um, who are still very influential, whether it's Deborah Hay or um, Steve. Steve Paxton or... Um, thinking. Uh, sorry? Simon Forti, absolutely. Who, who using movement as uh, where the movement is a, itself is a form of exploration subjecthood and being in the world and being a social being and or Kirsty Simpson or, you know, there's... Work, dance itself is that kind of work. Um, and other you, people use dance as a form of aesthetic or as a form of architectural exploration or as a form of something else. So I think, you know, it covers the whole remit, really, just as, as a visual artist or a sculptor might do. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think, you know, if we're going to come to a close, we've spoken so much here about Yvonne Rayner, and so I <laughs> hope you all come again, you know, um, on July 25th, when we'll have um, Catherine Wood, um, Martin Ashley von Rainer in conversation. But thank you very much. Thank you.